<laughs> All right, let's let's get on to the uh, let's get on to the subject at hand, which is the presentation today. We're going to go over what we've been doing, what's going on now that David's joined us, uh, all the wonderful things that may be coming mm -hmm. about in the next number of years. Like I said, we're going to focus on AI today, generative AI, and what that means for the rest of us. So I am now going to share my screen. If you guys can just verify if you can see it, that would be great. All right, there we go. Okay, so my my name is Omar Khan, as you guys know. Uh, our details, myself, Matthew, and David are right here. So please contact us if you have any questions whatsoever, okay? Uh, today we're gonna talk about, like I said, we're gonna talk about the theme of generative AI, okay? What we've been up to for the last two weeks, summary of outstanding positions. As you know, the portfolio was constantly selling puts, selling calls, and what we're looking out for in the next number of weeks ahead, okay? So myself, Matthew, and, and David are going to be the presenters, of course. All right, so here's the first theme. Generative AI. Now, everyone's probably been hearing about this the whole AI buzzword. I'm sure you have, David. I'm sure you have, Matthew, obviously, since we're obviously in the know. Uh, but a lot of you guys are there listening. Have you heard of AI of late? Of course. You can see how much stock like NVIDIA has been driven up. And this buzzword that's going around, AI, AI, AI. What does that mean? What is AI going to mean to us as investors, as human beings? What is it going to mean? Now, let's take a look at the market currently, okay? Generative AI's current market, okay, and that's the annual uh, spend by end user revenue wise is about 13 billion. You can see the different categories, media and entertainment, IT and telecom, gaming, healthcare. Uh, I'm not even sure what BFSI is, automotive and transportation, and there's a few others. Now that market right now is at $13 billion. It's expected to grow by an annual compound, compound annual growth rate of 36.5%. Per year, okay? Now, if you take the rule of 72, how often does that market double? Well, 72 divided by 36 is every two years. So, so it's hold on. BFSI is banking, financial services, and insurance. There we go. So it's a good chunk, actually. It's a good chunk. So, a good chunk, yeah. Now, yeah. actually, we're going to talk about banking in a little more detail uh, going forward. Now, that market is expected to go from $13 billion today to 100 and almost $10 billion in the year 2030. So that is a lot of revenue that is going to be generated from AI. And it's very difficult also to forecast how much this is going to be happening in the future. Now, I'll give you an example of how this is kind of all tied together, okay? Let's say, for example, I am, uh, uh, I have to change the, I want to make the customer service experience better at Rogers or Bell or TELUS as an example. And I'm, I'm not picking on those companies. This is just an example. And extrapolate this example out to many other companies around the world. I don't know if anyone is enjoys calling Bell or Rogers, but I despise it. I, I really don't like the process. I'm on the phone for an hour. It's extremely frustrating. And you get bounced around from here to there and your call gets dropped. Anyways, it is not a fun experience. All right. So let's say one of these companies looks at this and says, well, how can we change this? We have a big expense center that is not doing a great job, our customer service center. What if we use AI to answer customers' questions? So what advantages does AI have? Well, AI has all of your data, right? It has you know, how much you paid for your cable, your cell phone, your internet, any business accounts you may have. It has all that access so one person doesn't have to look it up and then transfer you to another department look it up. Now, how do you get rid of your entire customer service department? What you do is you take your data that you have and the millions and millions of hours of data that you have from listening to client calls. Now that data has to be processed. It's gonna need a lot of compute power. Luckily, NVIDIA and AMD manufacture chips to be able to go over this data. This data, because it's in vast, vast quantities, it will be housed on a cloud. The three leaders in the cloud division are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft with Azure, and Google, okay? So now you've got all this data that, that the AI system is going through, okay, and trying to mimic training a neural net and trying to mimic an artificial intelligence, and trying to mimic basically how a human would react to this particular conversation. Now, once that's done and the, the training is done, and that requires, again, the more data you have, the better your AI system would be. So now that when somebody has an inquiry of Rogers or Telus or Bell or any other company, and they go through this example, you can just type in what you want to ask, 
and you should get a response back. Now, as this advances, I'm sure there'll be voice uh, AI as well, but right now it's going to be limited to, you know, typing. So you type in, Hey, I, my, I got overcharged for my bill last month, send. And it'll be able to pull up your bill. You'll verify everything. And then you'll get a response back. No customer service involved. Now that's just one company. Now you can see you need chips for that because you have to process vast, vast amounts of data. The data has to be housed somewhere. That's where cloud comes in, right? We talked and we're just trying to show you how this all fits together. And then finally, you're going to spit out an artificial intelligence system, which is going to then replace a lot of workers, which is going to save you tons of money and generate additional revenue for the company. This is telling about the additional revenue that's going to be generated. Okay. Now you can see there's a few different projects that went in. So it shows you how big this is going to be in the future. As AI gets more and more data, faster compute power, and learns and learns and learns, it is going to vastly change our lives. Now, a few that have come into play of late, if you look at Microsoft Copilot, okay, that was released in February of 2023 and almost a year ago, right? Now, Copilot is going to be basically Microsoft 360 with AI built into it. So if you want an Excel spreadsheet done or a PowerPoint done, instead of having to do it manually, you can just tell it what to do and it'll get better and better and better. Google released Gemini. Okay, so these companies are very well positioned to benefit from sometimes not only the additional revenue growth in artificial intelligence, but secondly, all that additional revenue in the cloud computing division. Okay, so here's the AI, US generative AI market. And again, it's very difficult to extrapolate out six years when something is growing exponentially. Very difficult to do it. But this is a forecast by. Uh, a reputable firm. Um, I can't recall that we have the we have the source here. Um, oh yeah, uh, Grandview Research. Uh, I read the report. It's pretty interesting. Now, if you look at here, U.S. generative AI market. Okay, you got transformative, gener generative uh, adversarial networks, GANs, variational autoencoders, and diffusion networks. Now, whatever all that stuff is, you can Google that later. Uh, but it, what it's showing you is simple, right? In 2022, that market, right, the AI market, because it's really in its infancy, 3.2 billion. And you can see now it's really starting to pick up steam. And 36.3% compounded annual growth rate computes to basically a doubling of that market. That is phenomenal. So that is exactly what is going on. This is going to be a huge thing. And the one example I gave you of, of, you know, of the telecom company, the fictitious telecom company that we have getting rid of their entire customer service department. Now imagine this happening across multiple industries, across multiple segments of their business. How many jobs are going to be lost to artificial intelligence? Now, artificial general intelligence, that is something different. That is going to come down the road after artificial intelligence becomes a bit more robust artificial general intelligence is basically when your ai gains a conscience basically it's uh i robot it's uh that could be a bit of a scene and i think that's going to require a lot of regulation but what we can tell uh with a high degree of you know of, of certainty and again nothing is 100 percent, but we can certainly tell that the world is going to be a very different place in a few years from now and these companies are going to spend a lot of money using this technology and that technology is going to affect our lives in very very substantial ways now in this process because when you eliminate jobs let's say we talked about at um, this fictitious telecom company now all of a sudden you've saved a ton of money that you're no longer paying all those people okay now either you can do one thing you can lower your prices which i suspect they probably won't do or you're going to have increased profits now increased profits will last for long and literally you have more market entrance that's basic economics. But now all those displaced workers who were for, you know, who used to be formerly, you know, customer service at one of the, at that telecom company, now they're going to do a different job in society. This grows GDP, it grows output. So this is going to affect our lives in very very profound ways over the next number of years. Um Applications are pretty much across the board. And this is just 
some of the major players. I don't want to get too much. Uh, according to McKinsey and Company, generally I could add 200 to 340 billion annually just in the banking industry, and 400 to 660 billion annually in the retail and consumer packaged goods industry. Some of the major players: Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Meta. Um, luckily, uh, the Theta Alpha portfolio is invested in all those companies. So if this actually does come to fruition, it could have a very positive. Uh, benefit to those companies. Matthew and David, would you like to add anything here? I mean, uh, the only thing I'd add here is that, you know, you, you can look into the numbers and a lot of them are staggering, right? Like really, really staggering. Look at look at the Kager numbers or CAGR numbers. And again, they're well into double digits. And the question is, okay, th this is nice. Th this is great. But like, what do I invest in today to take advantage of that? There's, you know, there's not an AI uh, stock, specifically an AI stock. There are stocks that have uh, departments that earn revenue from artificial intelligence. That's correct. There, there are uh, chip manufacturers that benefit from producing ch uh, chips that help in the AI process. And you know, you have to look at the investment tool that you are going to use to take advantage of this uh, opportunity if you believe indeed it is an opportunity. Right. So what we have done is we've yeah, we've measured the market. We like, okay, well, we like what we see there, and we will go to the household names that we like and that we've done our research on and we believe are, you know, uh financially sound to partake in this opportunity. Now, yes, Microsoft it has other lines of uh revenue outside of AI, as does Alphabet, as does Amazon, as does Meta. Right. Which provides a very good cushioning effect. Right. Because this is a new part of the business that would, that could have, you know, profound effects on the entire uh, on the entire lot of the business. Absolutely. But we like the fact that, you know, these are stable uh, household names have been around for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, we certainly do like the fact that they are in this uh, are in this industry. And that uh, you know we are we are using those as our proxy to gain exposure to the AI industry. So we do like that absolutely. Um, David, anything else to add there? So there's two different uh, concepts being presented to everyone right now. One is um, is AI going to be what it's going to be? Is it going to be the game changer? And then uh, to pick up on Matthew's comments, so if it is, how do we create exposure? Um, well, there's no question that the expectations are extraordinarily high. And in some senses of the word, that is probably the most significant thing in of itself. Because if the expectation is there, then ultimately from an investor perspective, um, it's the more people who agree with you, the better off you're going to be. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's because you've got a consensus or agreement um, that it's it's going to work. Uh, that being said, if I had to add something to um, uh, Omar's comments, is it going to grow? Yes. Do we know the exact path as to how it's going to grow? No. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, and what does that mean? It's because we can't see how people are going to employ it. We're not sure how it's going to get customized. We're not sure how it's going to learn. And we're not going to know how we're going to learn from it. I don't know how many people have played with AI. I have. I have chat GPT, done some interesting things. And yeah, you can get quite sophisticated. And if you're if you're good, you could actually build up some really helpful analysis um, and, and material. So yes, it's going to take time. But again, the, a river flows um, in a sense. There's a wonderful line, follow the river, it always follows true. And I think that's what's going to end up happening is that there, we're going to create some breakthrough economies of scale, scope, whatever, in the use of AI. And all of a sudden, that's going to be where everyone plows in. That's how the river is going to follow uh, flow true. Um, so for us, we have to use a slightly broader brush 
uh, or investment brush in terms of exposure to AI for the simple reason that it's not entirely clear to me um, where it's just going to flow naturally, what kind of breakthrough. Um, and so, yes, we're going to start with a broader approach and then we'll refine it as we go along. But guess what? Uh, you're limited by your imagination right now. And I do know, um, having studied a fair amount of uh, um, psychology, sociology about certain things, um, there is a massive role uh, for AI in a number of different areas that people just don't quite understand. Um, the problem with humans is that uh, we're, we're really guilty of drinking our own Kool-Aid, believing in ourselves about everything. Um, there are people who will tell you, I'm a tremendous judge of character. I can see things better. Well, statistically, it doesn't really work. Um, and what we're going to find is that if we marry AI with our own skill sets and our own intuitions, we're going to find better ways to utilize it. But again, this comes back to the same issue. It's going to be broad until we find out better ways to, to channel it. And by the way, first time I was on chat GPT, they had very limited um, advice on how to use it. Now there's demonstration videos. There's all kinds of stuff. It's going to get better and better and better. Um, yes, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And I actually showed my wife some stuff that I did. And she was like, oh, my goodness, are you serious? Yeah, that's what I just did. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be... Uh... It's only going to get better and better from here. And how it exactly unfolds, I don't think anyone really knows that to your point, nope. David. You guys, I, I'm old enough to remember when the internet first came. I'm like, what is this internet thing? Right? They taught us the first year university, like, here, here, this is a computer lab. You can log on to this thing called the internet. I'm like, all right. And when you're 18 year old, 19 year old kid, you don't really know what the ramifications are. I don't think anyone at that point knew what the internet would mean to us, you know, today, even 10 years ago. So we know. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of money spent on it. It's going to change our way, life in a lot of ways, but no one really knows how it's going to unfold. We're going to look at the companies that are going to benefit from this inevitable spend and hopefully revenue generate. Uh, I, well, I, I remember when the internet first came out, and this may date me just even by using this phrase, if you can hardly believe it, but it was called the information superhighway. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, right. The information um, superhighway. I just want to put out a conceptual argument out there. Imagine you're walking through the forest and you have an idea, you have an inspiration. And clearly this seems to have been what happened is that somebody was walking through the forest outside of Seattle and said, you know what? I'm going to create a chain of coffee houses that charge two to three times what everyone else will. I'm pretty certain I'm gonna make it work. I don't know. If I was an investor back then, I'd say no. Anyways, that's essentially what happened with uh, Starbucks. The guy actually came in and said, yeah, I'm going to charge two and three times what everyone else charges. And I'm going to be able to sell as much coffee as anyone can ever imagine. And I'm going to have stores everywhere. At first blush, you're going, no way. Why would you ever invest in it? Well, it worked because he tapped into something else. The fact that you don't know exactly why it's going to work doesn't mean you try but the cool thing is you try and then you recognize and get inspired by what it is that you see as the outcome they're coming not just for the coffee but for the social environment they're doing this they're doing that and you create a, it becomes a destination place hey ai is going to be like that too we just don't know what it's going to look like and the mere fact that we cannot conceive of it has nothing to do with where it's going to be. That's our limitation, not AI's limitation. Thank you, David. Uh, just moving on here, we're gonna talk about this uh, gen of AI in different sectors, okay? And you can take high-tech banking, pharmaceuticals. Again, these are projections, but you can see the amount of spend and the percentage of total revenue, it's gonna have a high impact. So it's gonna have an impact on so many different categories, you know, talent, corporate, strategy, risk. Uh, and this is across multiple sectors. So, and again, these are very difficult to project forward. 
You just you know it's going to be impactful. You know it's going to occur. You don't know to the degree, and you don't know how quickly or how slowly it will. But you're trying to forecast this off and look again. Look at what companies are best positioned to benefit from this inevitable growth. Now, McKinsey and Company Research generated that could add equivalent of two point six to four point trillion to the global economy annually. Now, that does not include something like a robot coming on board. This is just generative AI. Now, just put that in the context for you. The global economy right now is around 100 trillion, give or take. So to add 2.6 to 4.4 trillion annually, it's substantial. Uh, it could be a lot higher than this. It could be lower, but it's going to be impactful. Um, Microsoft is charging $30 for, per month, per user, for AI feature co-pilot. AI system will be integrated in, into 365, and it makes a lot of tasks easier. If you haven't used it, I highly encourage you to use it. Take a look and see what you think. Alphabet, also announced another AI tool for business. Enterprise can access the tool for, again, $30 a month. Now, if you're going to pay 30 bucks a month, but now all of a sudden you're much more productive, that is totally worth it. That's just two companies. Meta's coming up with AI model Llama. Uh, NVIDIA and AMD, uh, they're also working on, on the generative AI plus they produce the chips, which power the data that needs to be gone through in order to process all of this and train the neural net. Amazon's to la launch two language models on AWS. Now, if you guys have any questions, this Matthew, I'd love to address them at the end. Moving on to what we've done in the, uh, the uh, portfolio and in, in the last couple of weeks. Well, we have again, we have a lot of accounts that are either now getting into the portfolios. We can't thank you guys enough. And we have a lot more in the pipeline. So we're working through them on a daily basis and getting the accounts in. And the plan is simple. The plan is to grow the portfolio, to grow the fund, to grow the number of investors, and to constantly keep people abreast of what is happening. A lot more on the horizon. I've continued to meet with investment advisors and uh, it's going through an approval process with multiple dealerships. Uh, once we hit a certain threshold uh, and get approval, for example, if you're on RBC's platform and RBC says, yes, we're good to go now, then you can walk into any RBC and you'd be approved on RBC's platform so somebody could buy it. And that's a big deal. So we're looking to do that very in the future. Like I said, financial advisors can bring in substantial assets. And what you want to have when you're growing a fund is you want to have a continual stream of new assets coming in. Right, so that you can always average down. Our strategy, the theta strategy, is best implemented when you're able to average in on a regular basis. And that's what we're looking to do here, okay? Now, the current exposure, as you can see, this is the desired exposure versus the current exposure. Uh, something new that we wanna talk about, there is a slight Bitcoin exposure. Now, why Bitcoin? Because we think Bitcoin is gonna be worth uh, a fair bit more in the future. It's a finite quantity of 21 million globally. And what the idea behind Bitcoin is to replicate, you know, uh, something similar to what people used to view gold as a store of value and a medium of transaction, right? So we moved away from the gold standard many, many years ago when it came to central banks around the world. And when you moved away from the gold standard in 1971 in the U.S., Bret Woods, what happened is now company, now governments can just print as much money as they want. And so Bitcoin is a medium to protect and build a blockchain, protect the value of an asset, meaning there's a limited quantity, 21 million, and you can transact. So if you wanted to go buy something across the world, and uh, I think El Salvador is the best example. They've actually used Bitcoin as their currency because they've experiencing massive inflation. So Bitcoin becomes the currency. So if I want to go buy something around the world, you know, in, in olden days, I'd have to take some gold and do it. Now I can take U.S. dollars. But even then, that subject, so I can only declare 10,000. Now you can transact globally without the interference of any central bank, any government around the world, and you can do it seamlessly. Still, now, there's still a lot to work in Bitcoin, but there's many, many reasons we like it. And we have a 2% position right now that could go, well, it's 1.6 right now. It could wind up going to... 3%. It's probably going to be around that 2 to 3% range. And you can see some of the other companies, Alphabet, Amazon, uh, Apple. 
Now, Alphabet and Amazon are really well positioned to take advantage of generative AI and also cloud computing. Apple is a household company across the world. Uh, they're a little bit late in their in their product cycle. You know, they have uh, it's not as easy for them to be able to churn out the same profits they were in the past. I'm hoping we are all hoping that they come up with some new products and also incorporate AI into their practice. Uh, but it's a smaller holding as a result because. You know, we, we identify, is there a need to replace your consumers like your iPhone as often as they used to be? Not as much as they used to be. Microsoft, desired exposures at 12%. It's our highest weighting along with Tesla. Why? Because it's a phenomenal business run by excellent people. It's going to benefit tremendously from AI growth and from cloud computing. Tesla, uh, currently we're at 12.9. The desired exposure is 12. I've, you guys probably heard me talk about Tesla 100 times. Uh, Tesla's, again, talking about the AI story and what becomes the currency of the future? What becomes the gold of the future? It's data. So if you're looking to sell, solve a problem like a car driving by itself, the most data, whoever has the most data, whoever can process that data and train their neural net to act like a human that person or that company will win the race to solve full self-driving. I don't think people realize how close Tesla is to solving full self-drive. I've used the last version. It's incredible. It's, it's pretty much there. And as the data and the compute power increases, hopefully this will be solved soon. And if it's solved, well, again, we think that'll be worth more. Attention. We've got great companies, AMD, again, benefiting from everything that we just talked about, Meta, uh, Eli Lilly, they're not companies of a different David alluded on this a little while ago. Uh, it's going to benefit from, like you said, uh, David, a competitor to Ozempic. Uh, a lot of uh, overweight people in North America, and that drug is wildly popular. And we wanted to diversify away from uh, having entirely uh, technology companies. Uh, TSM, Taiwan Semiconductor, all these chips have to be manufactured by someone. Well, TSM controls almost 60% of the global market of manufacturing of chips. NVIDIA, there's an insatiable appetite for NVIDIA, NVIDIA's chips. Why? Because they are able to process the most amount of data as quick as possible. So if you're training your full self-driving system at Tesla and you need to process millions or hundreds of millions of hours of data, you know, the, 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 it has to look at how would a human react in the situation? The more data that has to be processed, the more compute power you need. And again, that has to be sorted in the cloud. So there's multiple companies that went out of this. But at the end of the day, if we get full self-driving, well, we're in a pretty good spot. Airbnb, our last position, that's the smallest position out of all the stocks. That's at 5%. Uh, and the desired, sorry, desired at 5 and 4.8 right now. So, uh, so far, so good, guys. We've been writing a lot of calls and puts on these positions. Uh, just a couple of things. If you go back there for a second, I just want to touch on uh, Apple and Tesla there. So a couple of different storylines over there. You'll notice that you know from a from a price uh, price action perspective, both Apple and Tesla are trading a little bit lower. And you know for for different reasons, you know Apple uh, because of uh, you know they they spent uh, I think ten billion on a on a car and it 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 didn't pan out as part of an R and D project. That I think is 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 hitting hitting the stock a little bit, in my opinion. And uh, secondly, you know, a, a news article did run across uh, the wire a couple of days back. I'm surprised it did not take out take up a little bit more, uh, uh, pick up a little bit more steam from that. But you know, they had some uh, you know significant impact to China iPhone sales specifically. And what we know of Apple is that you know they do primarily sell iPhones. Yes, they have a lot. Like their service service business is increasing. Uh, at a reasonable pace, but you know they do. They, you know they are known for their iPhone production and sales, right? Now that being said, you know we have to walk a fine line to saying, listen, if we think Apple is a good long-term position to hold, it's you know a two point something trillion dollar company, right? Then this you know one position to take is now is the time to load up on it, and that is partly what we are starting to do uh, because it potentially could be seen as undervalued, right? Uh, Tesla by the same notion um you know you, you, you it, it has hit a little bit of a downward slump due to various factors it sometimes doesn't uh it, it kind of beats to the tune of its own drum oftentimes we've seen in terms of price action and uh, again similar 
opinion we have on that you know is this a good time to you know load up on the stock because we don't believe it should be valued as a car company and indeed is then uh potentially undervalued right uh i mean i think uh there's a there's an analyst that came on bloomberg tv the other day and he says and he basically he quite frankly said if you think uh tesla is a car company you shouldn't buy it like flat out and i, I would tend to agree with that kind of remark uh and again you know, we're positioning ourselves accordingly, right? On the other side of things, when you look at the charts for some of these these stocks, yes, they have gone, uh, you know, pretty high, and it's and then we are looking for other ways to profit from that by writing options and uh, and potentially going long as they have momentum on their side. Okay, Omar, anything else you'd like to add there? I no, thank kind you. of cut you off, but yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, um, let's go here. So are we, we're, we're registered uh, eligible. Also, uh, David, if you could comment on RDS piece. Uh, yeah, uh, so basically because it, this is a trust, um, uh, it's an eligible investment for any registered account. Um, the what, is, one... David, what, what exactly is an RDSP? Because I'm sure oh. I, this is the one thing I think most Canadians have no clue an RDSP actually exists, how beneficial it is for the actual uh, end user. Um, it's extraordinary because an RDSP means Registered Disability Savings Plan, and it's very much like an RESP, a, a Registered Educational Savings Plan, um, in the sense that as you make a contribution to an RDSP, it triggers loans and grants depending on your um, financial situation from the government. And uh, they are quite and extraordinarily generous and, and beneficial. Um, the key thing to open an RDSP is that you receive what's called a disability tax credit form from CRA. Uh, you have to go online uh, and submit um, the details to CRA and, um, you know, they review the materials and um, then they issue you what's called a DTC. Um, once you have that, then you are eligible to um, uh, open an, an RDSP. Um, in fact, you, you you can open an RDSP without having a DTC, but uh, if you make a contribution to your uh, account, uh, it will not trigger any grants or loans because um, they'll check the files with CRA. And once you've made a contribution, it's not tax deductible, but uh, so a $3,000 or $1,500 deposit into an RDSP might trigger 5,500 in grants and loans. And fifty five hundred, uh, David. If I put in fifteen hundred bucks, if someone were to be eligible, I would. I could get up to fifty five hundred dollars in grants. How much of yes. that is loans, and how much is grants? Uh, it just depends. There's a, a formula. Um, there's a cap on the grants, and there's a cap on the loans. Um, but it, it's meant to help people who uh, don't have uh, means. Uh, now there are some. Uh, it's a special program, but it is tough to. Uh, um, qualify in the sense that you have to uh, meet the definition of a disability as defined by CRA. Uh, but once you're there, that's great. And um, you're allowed to contribute up until the age of 49 um, because the minimum investment period is 10 years. Uh, so the money goes in, uh, it vests out. And then when you um, turn 59, you have to start uh, making uh, monthly withdrawals, very much like an, a RIF. Uh, you have to make month, monthly withdrawals when you turn 71. When you're with an, have an RDSP, you have to start making uh, monthly withdrawals um, when you turn uh, uh, basically 60. But it's a tremendous program. We can help. We have some RDSPs. We know all, all about it. And um, we have specialized in that area. But one of our employees is currently on mat leave, who's an expert, but that's She's available if we want to talk and consult and help you. So basically, guys, if you know anyone who has a disability, uh, and then, David, perhaps you could uh, give a couple of examples of eligible disabilities. So for example, uh, type 1 diabetic eligible? Uh, um, potentially, yes. I do know some diabetics who have qualified. Um, Physical ailments are much easier to to secure, to secure a DTC um, tax certificate. Uh, mental illnesses are possible. Um, it's they're just a little bit. Um, I, I'm not going to lie. They're um, they want it to be 
um, there's just going to be a higher bar to prove it. You're going to have to provide additional information and material. Uh, but uh, where you often see it is if uh, somebody has um, a mental handicap or whatever, uh, or a significant physical handicap, uh, any of those people would typically automatically qualify. And it, you know, you can do it for yourself, uh, or you can have somebody sponsor you, or you can do it for somebody who's, um, you know, needs some help to help set it up. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, guys, if you guys know anyone who has a disability and there's many that qualify, this is free money. The government's going to give you tons of grants. Uh, and you can invest it in these funds. Here's all the fund codes for anyone who's, who's watched this. Uh, so what are we up to in the, in the fund? Well, outstanding exposure as a percentage of AUM. So that means how much have you exposed based on how much is in the portfolio? Now it's 95%. So we're looking to get some positions. If we don't, that's great because May is right around the corner and we know that seasonally strong, uh, week, strong period of time is coming to an end. A lot of cash secured puts, 52 um uh, exposure and cash secured puts as a percentage of aum that's 75 that means 20 percent of the portfolio is actually invested in long stock mainly apple tesla some amd uh and a little bit of airbnb uh we've done some covered calls uh not a lot because again you don't want to be doing a lot of covered calls during the seasonally strong period of time you got to be really careful because the stock can run away on you because the markets tend to perform well number of long positions that's the companies i told you about uh, and 20% of the exposure we have, we've generated about 3.2% in AUM as a percentage, okay? And the average duration is 21 days. The closer we get to May 5th, the more we're looking to ratchet that down. Come May 5th, <laughs> excuse me, we're going to look to get more into cash because that is the end of the seasonally strong period of time. VIX has been hovering at 12, 13, 14 Sub-16 volatility since October. We all know what mean reversion is, right? When others are greedy, be fearful. When others are fearful, be greedy. Right now, there's a lot of greed. Some point in time, VIX is going to spike and greed, I'm sorry, fear is going to come back. We want to have a lot of cash on hand. And since a lot of new assets are coming in, thanks to you guys, we'll be able to average down and hopefully buy some stuff on the cheap when we get an inevitable pullback. But that's where we stand right now. So, so far, so good. Like I said, May tends to be a volatile month. Volatile meaning not the best. Uh, July happens to be the best month in the summer. And then September and October are typically the worst months. So in the summer months, if you have some long positions that you like, you can strongly look at writing covered calls. And then look at writing puts once what happens, you guys know, when volatility spikes. When that fear goes high and volatility spikes, you get paid a lot more for your puts. And that's when you want to take advantage of lower pricing and additional volatility. Uh, upcoming rate cuts we have for the second and third quarter. Now, the first, we're probably going to get rate cuts in Canada before we get to the States. The economy in the States is far stronger than the economy in Canada. And we're really starting to wilt under the pressure of this housing market. So rate cuts are coming probably in both countries, more likely in Canada first and maybe faster than in the U.S. US elections, U.S. elections on the horizon. Currently, the Republicans are in the lead, according to many polls. That's generally pretty good for the stock market, but we'll see. If you'd like to contact us, guys, here's our contact information. Myself, Matthew, please contact us. We uh, are more than happy to help. And thank you so much for helping us build this company. Here's a, con here's a disclaimer. Helping us start all over again. Uh, we cannot thank you guys enough. Uh, this is something that Matthew and I have wanted to do for our whole lives. So we cannot thank you guys enough. Um, and we look forward to prospering with you in the 